Good afternoon and welcome to the Animal Justice Party Facebook Live series. This is probably our last live session for 2020, but what a way to end out the year. What a wonderful guest we have. Jackie Norman is an absolute inspiration. She's evidence that absolutely anybody can change. Jackie is a former dairy farmer turned animal advocate and vegan, and she joins us today from New Zealand. Jackie, how are you? Hi there, Emma. I'm very well, thank you. I'm very honoured to be your last guest for the year. Yes, <laughs> it's exciting, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> Jackie, look, I guess the burning question for everyone is, um, you know, what's your story? I mean, how did you get into dairy farming? And then obviously what changed and got you out of dairy farming and into advocacy? Wow, where do you start? Um, <laughs> well, it's, it all started when I was 19. So I, I grew up in a, a tiny wee village in Hampshire in the UK and um, pulled a very classy move when I was 19. I ran off to New Zealand with a, a Kiwi barman and uh, I didn't have a work permit or anything like that. It was all quite spontaneous and, and nobody thought that I would last out over here. And he was from a dairy farming background. And so that was the kind of work that he got into. And um, at first, I just sort of started tagging along a bit. I was twiddling my thumbs a bit, playing house and um, cooking for the other guys that worked on the farm as well. And then eventually I started getting bored and yeah, learned how to milk cows. It was the last thing that I ever thought I would be doing. I actually, I was scared of cows when I was growing up in the UK. <laughs> <laughs> I used to run away from them. Um, and so then, you know, by, by being so close to them, I learned how docile that they were. And I thought it was very, um, very daring thing to be doing. You know, not only did I run over to the other side of the world when I was 19, I was also milking cows, which was way far from the, the tourism degree that I planned to do and all the, the conventional things that my friends were doing, not realizing that, you know, being in New Zealand, getting into dairy farming was about the most conventional thing to be doing at the yeah. time. <laughs> Wonderful. And, and, and how did that then sort of switch? At what point what, were you working on this dairy farm? Was there sort of a moment where you just said, like, I can't do this anymore? Um, it was a long time before I got to that stage and, um, you know, a, a big period of years. I was vegetarian on and off since I was 13. Um, and once I began farming, you know, I, I definitely cemented that um, connection in that, you know, the whole meat and death, you know, something has to die for me to, to eat meat. And so that really cemented it, you know, the, the boss would, would have animals for the freezer for want of a better expression. And I would be like, no, I, I can't eat that at all. So, so there was a lot of things that as time went on, you know, it was all very exciting to begin with to, to milk the cows. And then as the seasons went past and I saw more insights and got given more responsibility, there was a lot that I, I didn't like, wasn't happy with, but I was always just told that was how it was. So, you know, the years just went by and, you know, looking back, there was a lot of things that I tried to do to get out of the industry. I was always coming up with these hair rain schemes to, you know, I wanted to, to run a cattery or something where I could just look after animals and, and, you know, love them and give them back kind of thing to their, to their loving owners. There was all, always some kind of plan that I was trying to hatch to get out of the industry. But, um, you know, I ended up marrying into the industry and it was, it was the, the thing to do at the time, you know, it was a very secure kind of career. You know, when I came over here, I didn't know anybody really that wasn't in the industry because it was seen as a very wholesome thing to do. It was a whole clean green, you know, we're the backbone of the country and it was very secure. You know, everybody wanted to climb the ladder. Everybody had those goals of one day owning their own farms. And so I was always yeah, I was told was, this was how it is. You know, this is the most secure job that we're going to get. This is the most money we're going to be able to make and, and all of those things. So, yeah, it, it took a long time to get out. <laughs> yeah, no, that, what sort of, um, I guess, practices in the dairy industry did you find most confronting or what kind of led you to start to change your mind about, about what was happening? I think it started quite early on, uh, probably my first calving season. That that was my first real taste of it, I suppose. And up until then, you know, I, I loved milking the cows. I was singing to them, you know, I chat to them and uh, gave them all names and that kind of thing. Um, and yeah, I thought it was a great thing to be doing. Like I said, I thought it was very wholesome. And I didn't have too much of the day-to-day -day running at that point, but there was one afternoon in the first calving season that I came down to the cow shed to see my partner at the time and, and the rest of the guys working. And there was this tiny wee little Jersey calf just sitting on, on her own in the concrete. 
I didn't have mum or anything around. And uh, I said, oh, is, is that one I can feed? Are you going to feed her after milking? Can I feed her? And it was it was the owner's job at the time. And he said, oh, no, 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 I'm, I'm going to bop that one on the head after work. You know, she, she's not worth anything. She's too small to even go on the truck. And I said, what do you mean she's not worth anything? You're going to hit her on the head. Why are you going to hit her on the head? She, he said, well, look at it. She's too small. She's not going to fetch me any money. And this is, I actually found photos of her. Oh, wow. <laughs> this, this is her at two weeks old. I don't oh. know if you can see, yeah, how, how yeah. small she is. Yeah. So that, that was at two weeks. And um, so you can imagine how tiny she was. And she was just so perfect. There was nothing wrong with her. And she just looked so beautiful. And, you know, I must have just flooded my eyelashes right and said, please, please, you know, can I have her? We've got a garden. We've got grass that needs eating. You know, I'll look after her. I didn't really know anybody at the time. I didn't have many friends or anything like that. And, um, he thought I was quite crazy, but he said, yeah, all right, you can, you can have her for 30 bucks. So I took her home and taught her to feed out of a bucket. And um, this is, this is her here. This is at eight weeks old. Oh, and, um, oh. <laughs> oh. Her, her name was Suki and she was my friend, you know, and we, we bonded uh, big time. And I used to, you know, we would lay out in the, in the sun together and I'd be reading a book, leaning up against her in the sunshine. And yeah, so she was the one that I really had the most to do with that first year because I wasn't responsible for for feeding cows and that kind of thing apart from Sugi and it was only the second year when we left that farm and we went to other farms that I got given more and more responsibility and that was when I became a lot more yeah hands-on and saw what went on and that was the time where you know I realized that yeah, you, you had to take the calves away from their mothers. And it sounds really stupid now because I can imagine people would be watching this and thinking, how can you think that's okay? And I didn't think that it was fine. You know, I, I, I hated it. It was awful. But, you know, I was told that was how it was. And I was impressionable. I was around a lot of people that, you know, I was just being constantly conditioned. And although I didn't like it, from my perspective, I was the one feeding the calves. And having looked after Suki, this this little one that I showed you, you know, I I knew, I patted them all, I sang to them all, I talked to them all. So mm. for me, you know, I, I knew that I was going to look after them. I wasn't looking at the big picture. I wasn't really looking at, you know, the ones that, I did look at the ones that going on the Bobby, tr Bobby truck. That's another story though, but yeah, all the ones that were in my care, I thought, you know, you're okay with me. You're, you're safe, you're warm. Um, you're fed, you're cared for, you know, I'm nice. <laughs> All of those things that we tell ourselves, you know, and so I was sort of saying, oh, it's okay, girls, you know, I'm going to look after your babies. I know that they're fine with me. And how in God's name, I ever thought that I could possibly replace their mother. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't nurture them or keep them warm at night, or I couldn't speak their language. We're of the same species. I mean, it, it's like, it's like trying to get a sheep to raise a human, you know, like poles apart, but somewhere along the line, we decided that, that was okay and that humans would do a really good job. And so, yeah, I, I used to, I used to have to be the one that was on the motorbike, you know, and the cat, the cow would be running behind and it was upsetting. It was really upsetting, but I guess for me, I kind of thought, right, well, once they get into the barn, I know that I'm going to look after them. And like I said, you, you don't look at the big picture at, at what's going to happen down the track or, or if you do, you try not to think about it too, too much. So um, the Bobbies were a, a different story. Um, mm. that, that was always awful. That was always heartbreaking. And I think they've changed it a bit now, like, um, because there's been such an outcry about bobby calves so when I was farming um, or up until certainly recent years you would have these big crates by the side of the road at, at, at the farm gate and so it was very easy for the bobby truck you know the, the calves would get fed in the mornings and then they get taken down put in this pen and twice a week or even three times a week sometimes the bobby truck would come along and, and pick up the calves and I remember the the house that that we were in for for some of those years they overlooked that pen and I'd be sitting there trying to have my breakfast in the morning and just crying you know to see the truck come along and the calves just get thrown into these trucks mm -hmm. and you know you're not supposed to do that then you, you see it all in the media about you know the way that these calves get treated and that they get thrown in and I witnessed it so many times because you know on a on these mornings there are hundreds of calves that are going into these trucks and so the drivers just get over it I mean I they just yeah they just want to get the job done get the get the calves in and on their way and so you know you see so many instances that you hear of of, of calves being trampled being injured and not being in in too good a state when they arrive you know and 
yeah, I used to cry so many times, you know, for years, at least twice a week, I would just sit there crying. Um, and yeah, every time I just got told, well, you know, that's a shame. Yes, it's sad. We all know it's sad, your soft hearted thing, but you know, this is how it's got to be. And so I think this is why so many people, you know, these days, I think the bobby pins are hidden because there was such an outcry that upset so many people to see these beautiful little animals, just like Suki, that, you know, there's nothing wrong with them um, getting taken off to the slaughterhouse. So these things are becoming a lot more hidden. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, you, you've kind of detailed the separation with the mothers and you've talked about the bobby calves. What are some of the other animal agribusiness practices in the dairy industry that, that many people probably aren't aware of that, that actually happen? Um, oh, God, where do you want me to start? Oh. <laughs> there, are, there are a lot of things. There are things that are, uh, you know, um, taken as, as practice and then there are other horrible hacks and that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, they, there are things like you hear of, of cows having their tails broken, that kind of thing. Um, I, yeah, I heard a lot about that. So, um, you know, my partner never, ever did anything like that. But um, there were people that I worked with and um, employers that I worked for as well that were always breaking tails. Um, there were things like um, there's a, a share milker of the year over here who recently had his award stripped from him for um, tweeting about a practice. And it was about to get cows to let down their milk. And so you know, he, he boasted on social media about how, oh, to get the cow to let the milk down, you just get a pipe and shove it up her and, and yeah. blow sharply into it. And, um, you know, that, that will, that, that works every time that'll get her to let her milk down. And I remember there being this massive outcry about this guy and, and what an awful guy he is. And yeah, it's awful. He shouldn't be winning share milker of the year or anything like that. But that was not a one-off, you know, this, this happens a lot. This is a common farming hack. He was just doing what a lot of people have done and someone would have told him previously to do. And, you know, another, another hack that I knew was um, squirting iodine into the cows, you know, presumably already raw birthing parts. Um, and that again was intended to trick the, the cow into thinking her body had given birth again to, to let her milk down. So there was all these little hacks like that, which I certainly didn't think was appropriate. Um, but again, I was just, yeah, I was always the, the wee one that didn't really have a voice. Um, yeah, we could, we could go on and on. <laughs> I, think, I think I've seen you talk somewhere about um, giving the cows an injection to encourage them to, to miscarry or, or to give birth early. Is that something yep. that's common as well? I don't know if it is anymore in New Zealand. I believe it's being phased out in Australia. And I know certainly up until a few years ago, um, by the time I left, there were a lot of vets that were thankfully refusing to do this because it's just so barbaric and that's certainly one of the the worst memories that I, I had um so inducing at the time it was it, it's all to do with you know cows are always done in on mass for want of a better expression so you know they're all supposed to come on heat at the same time then they all get impregnated at the same time and then they all give birth at the same time and so it's very inconvenient you know if cows don't get in calf when they're supposed to and they don't give them give birth when they're supposed to you know because then you obviously don't get enough milk out of them that, that you would like to and so because of this yeah any cow that was due to give birth in say september october rather than july or august would um get what they call induced so just like humans you know they would be um brought to give birth early and this was normally i think a course of three injections that was administered by a vet and the vets would come along beg your pardon i can't remember how far apart they were it could have been a week apart it could have been a fortnight but eventually after this course of injections, some would only take two injections but certainly by three the cows would all start uh, aborting their calves and it was just hideous, absolutely hideous. You know, if you were, I guess if, if it was a blessing that if a calf was too small, that it was, it was born dead. Um, and obviously the, the closer it was to term, the more formed the cow, the calf would be, but you know, it may look okay on the outside, be a bit small, hair would be a bit shorter, but you know, the little lungs wouldn't be developed or they weren't very strong on their feet. Um, and you would see, you know, nobody wanted those. The, no, the bobby trucks didn't want them. They were too small. You know, their 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 hair, their, their skins, awful word, but um, weren't any use for anything. And so, 
it was usually up to the farm workers to dispatch of these um, these calves and oh you know I, I think the the worst memory that I have there was one paddock one day that we went into and there was 22 cows that had given birth to these half formed calves and you could see them just so confused you know and just willing their babies to to just get up to to respond to stand to be able to nurse just the confusion and and you know they knew something was wrong and there was nothing they could do about it and it was just you know that that was the closest i've ever seen to seeing farm workers broken because you know it was their job to to go and dispatch of these these 22 calves um and every year it was the same and every year they said i'm never doing that again you know it would, it would just break them having to do this and it was normally by um a blow to the head or something of some sharp implement that kind of thing and sometimes you know sometimes this took time it, it wasn't it, it wasn't easy to do you know <laughs> it sounds so awful talking about it um but yeah, I think, I, I think, yeah, by the time I left, you know, I get a bit lost for words remembering that because I just remember seeing that hill and seeing those cows and calves and just, you know, and for these, these animals, to, these mothers to have someone come along and, and kill the babies in front of them, you know, they know something's wrong, but they've just, they've got no control over anything in their lives, really, no control over anything at all. And that's, and that's part of it, isn't it? I mean, that's part of the main issue with dairy is that, that any mother that's stuck in these industries, that just total lack of control over their own body and obviously control over their own young. Um, I think that's almost what's the most confronting about all of it. It's just that all of that's been taken away. Yes. Let's, let's talk about something a little bit lighter because I know I've been dragging you through that. <laughs> Um, now you've also done a certificate in nutrition recently. Yes. Yeah. So from now from your understanding of nutrition, um, how does dairy play into people's health or ill health? Oh, well, um, I guess, I mean, I could, I guess mine's a pretty good example. I mean, when, when I went vegan, um, there were, there were all kinds of things that everyone, you know, quite often describes having a journey to veganism and in mine was also the same, but I would say health also played its part as well in being very beneficial. Um, I was having a lot of chronic pain problems and that kind of thing. And I was on 22 painkillers at a time, like gnarly ones, you know, <laughs> and yeah, um, at one stage I was bedridden for seven months and when I was, when I became vegan, I got down from 22 painkillers a day to five, um, sometimes none at all. And that's, that's still the same. And the first thing that I noticed was my migraines disappeared. So um, funny, I mean, ironically, I never drank cow's milk. I was lactose intolerant from you know, <laughs> when I was born. So, and I think... You know, like I said, there's going to be people out there watching me like, how could you do this? You know, why did you not make the connection between, you know, you were vegetarian. Why didn't you go vegan? Maybe I have no reasoning. All I can think of is that maybe because I never drank cow's milk myself, it took me longer to make that connection as to whose milk it really was and why the hell should I be the one drinking it? You know, that's all I can think of. But um I was able to tolerate things like cheese from when I was about 17, 18. And so I kind of made up for those years. <laughs> and so the first thing I noticed is that my migraine stopped, you know, I'd, I'd been working uh, in computers for, for a while. And I thought that went with the territory. Migraines were a daily occurrence for me. So that was the first thing that stopped, but yeah, just, just felt so much better. You know, my husband, he lost 40 kilos um, when he went vegan as well. So yeah, I would never, ever go back ever. <laughs> and I, knowing what I know now as well, um, I did the course during lockdown. Um, for anyone that's interested, it's the eCornell plant-based nutrition certificate, which is run by the uh, Center of Nutrition Studies, um, Dr. K T. Colin Campbell, who wrote the China study. And when I did that course, oh my, I just thought, why is this stuff even legal? You know, cow's milk is made of 80% of casein at least. And that's one of the, the top, you know, most relevant chemical carcinogens there is. And yet this is, you know, we, this is promoted as being this must have nutritious food that's needed for our growth, for our bones. And 
Good Lord. Yeah. I mean, the, the stuff that we learned then, and it really made me learn how much, why these doctors fight, you know, um, the, the Dr. Gregors, the Dr. Esselstyns, the Dr. Campbells, because what they know and have known for, for 40, 50, 60 years, and they're still fighting against this and they're still seeing, you know, heart disease, diabetes, cancers at all time highs to still be up against this. But yeah, the, you know, the, the more people that can learn, the better. And knowledge is just so powerful. Yeah, and, and, it, and it's interesting. You know, I went vegan 20 years ago. And, and as you say, these doctors were out there then sort of pushing these messages. Um, and yet now I feel from 20 years ago that there has been this consumer shift and we're seeing an increase in plant milks. I think when I went vegan 20 years ago, there was just so good was the option. I think there was yeah. full fat soy milk and as the one option, it was a long life and that was it. <laughs> um, so to see, you know, this massive growth in plant-based milks and also we're seeing a consumer drop in cow's milk. Um, and, I, and I think that's testament to a lot of work that they've been doing and a lot of animal advocacy groups and things like that as well. Um, and of course, people like you that are actually getting out there and, and, and being able, now you're equipped obviously with this, nutrition degree you're equipped to talk about what happens in the industry um, but also to talk about nutrition and, and the health benefits of, of actually eliminating these animal products from the diet. You recently also gave evidence at a parliamentary inquiry into the sustainability of the dairy industry and it was interesting after um, we had you in actually another member of the committee came up to me and said that he was quite moved by, by your story and all the evidence that you gave at the inquiry. And he said he went home and told his family about it over dinner. Do you find that you often get that kind of reaction? Um, you know, you're, you're able to come from a very different angle than other people that are just sort of putting forward facts. Um, do you find that that sort of works in a different way for you to be able to express and advocate for animals? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, that's so nice. I got that feedback. I, I had a message from someone in Australia that was watching as well. And she said, my family and I were cheering at the TV, you know, with everything you were saying. So that was really cool. Um, and yeah, yeah, I do get a lot of that. You know, there are more of us uh, that are coming forward, which is fantastic. And I, I was really nervous about um, giving evidence, but on hearing the speakers before me, it actually made me feel really empowered to go in there because I, I was coming from a different angle and I did have different insight and experience. And I thought, you lot can't pull the wool over my eyes. You know, <laughs> sorry guys, if any of you are watching. Um, but yeah, I, I found it a very empowering experience. I think one thing which probably made a difference, which they probably didn't expect as well was, um, you know, I revealed in the inquiry that not only was I an advocate from, a, you know, having dairy inside experience. I wasn't just this, this weedy vegan that, you know, never got her hands dirty and, and didn't really know anything. You know, I, I had that side of the industry with me. Um, but also, you know, I'm actually a mother who has lost a child. So that's something that, you know, I've got a pretty, <laughs> what with my dairy background and, and what with actually having lost a child, having given birth to a child and have him pass away two days later. I know what that loss is like and I think I was you know I was able to relay that somewhat in um in the hearing and it's you know you it's a it's so hard <laughs> I guess one one good way to put it the other night I was talking to a friend of my mother's and he's in his 80s and he's Australian and he is you know he's been around a while so he's he's pretty he's pretty opinionated on everything from rugby into farming and he's been around for a while so he knows a lot about lots of things and so we got into this discussion about veganism and and why you know um but surely you know cows are, are more ecologically sound you know it's, it's, it's better for the planet that than we you know grow all this these crops you know even though we're feeding what 98 percent of them to our animals in the first place so we were getting into all that and um, my husband was starting to get a bit sort of head up because this guy wouldn't back down you know oh but I've got an argument for everything and in the end I, I spoke to him about what happens to cows and how their babies are taken away and I said I know what it's like to lose one child to have one baby you know taken from you you, you know someone take him away 
Um, it's actually 26 years ago this week. So uh, we share the same birthday and, you know, it's, it doesn't get easier. You live with it, but it's just how it is. You know, I, I've got this saying that uh, I don't think life gives you any more than you can handle, you know? <laughs> so these, these things happen for a reason, but, you know, I know what it's like to have someone take my baby away forever. And even though I knew what happened to him and, you know, I, it was still felt so powerless. There was absolutely nothing I could do. Nothing would bring him back, but I knew that everything that was done for him that that could have been done for these cows they've got no idea you know apart from the ones that have their babies murdered in front of them they've got no idea where their babies go you know 26 years later i'm still wondering about my son you know what would he look like now what if things have been different where is he what's he doing you know and for me i went through that once and that was the worst thing that could possibly happen I think as, as far as I'm concerned, you know, in, in my years on this planet, it's the most horrendous thing. It's something that's, that scars you and is always with you. You learn to carry it, but it's always with you. But for me, you know, once was bad enough for cows. We're doing this year after year after year. And people still don't realize that, you know, cows are like humans in that they have to carry their babies for nine months in their body and feel them moving and give birth to them, which is no blimmin' small thing, you know, and then we just come along and take their babies year after year. And I know a lot of vegans that um, I've spoken to and, and activists as well, which I guess is another reason why I'm glad to have this insight. You know, it, it seems to be a thing that they say, oh, cows get milk for, for five years and then they go down and, and then they get sent to slaughter well for one thing if a cow can't get up she's not sent to slaughter because she has to be able to get on the truck so you know over here you just end up as, as pet food or something like that but um yeah there's this perception that cows only get to live until they're five years old i knew many cows that were 10 years old and in fact you know i knew i knew one cow in particular that um was 16 years old when she finally went on the truck and you know considering the first cow gives birth um at two two years old roughly um that was 14 babies she had taken away from her and so you know it's no wonder they look so downtrodden so depressed and so wretched and so somehow after a few wines and getting a bit fired up with this this 80 year old chap you know i put all this out there to him i said look mate this is what it's like you know and this is what we are doing again and again and again and even now people your age are not realizing that you know this has to happen for you guys to drink milk and he just stopped and just looked at me you know dead in the eye and said i've never thought of it like that mm -hmm. and i thought you know, this is why I'm doing what I'm doing. This is, this is what I'm here for, you know? <laughs> so, so yeah, that's a long, long winded explanation, but yeah, I guess I've got a pretty unique perspective in, in both of those areas. Yeah. And, and, and thank you for your, for your raw honesty and for, for sharing such a personal story with us. And I know that there'll be a lot of people listening that totally relate to you, Jackie, as well. And are just so grateful that I can't imagine how hard it is i mean you're sort of you know you kind of hinted like there's probably people watching thinking how could she not know but i think that probably most people that are watching are just so grateful that you have the courage to talk about what you did and how that's changed you and why and what's actually happening inside this industry because i think that there you know you've talked about sort of this stiff upper lip um attitude and it's the same in australia as new zealand and you know, it really is forced on people within these industries to turn a blind eye, um, to not think about it, to, to realize that that's life. Um, and it takes a very strong and brave person to actually step away from that and say, actually, I'm not okay with this. Um, and I'm gonna advocate against it. So thank you. Um, the question at our New South Wales inquiry was, is the dairy industry a sustainable industry? So my question to you is, is it a sustainable industry? And if not, why not? No, I don't believe it's sustainable at all. I mean, um, I've worked, you know, it's, it's something that I'm learning more about all the time. But, you know, as, as we said before, you know, the, the vast majority, what, 90 something percent of, of all the, the crops that are grown, the soy and the um, yeah, particularly soy, we, we, we always get told that, you know, all the humans are, all you vegans are eating all the soy, you know, it's grown to feed animals, you daft things. <laughs> you know, but, you know, it's not, it's not getting out there. It's not until you start digging and until you yeah start waking up that you, you learn more and more about this kind of stuff. But yeah, I mean, when I was working on doing the submission for, for the inquiry, 
um, just looking into New Zealand alone, I think, well, we, we pay something like the, the millions, not, not just millions, but billions of dollars in subsidies that are paid over here in New Zealand into propping up the dairy industry. You know, it's, it's promoted as being the lifeblood of New Zealand, but that's not the case anymore. You know, we're not animal agriculture. The dairy is not the number one industry. Um, you know, it's barely in the top 10. And if it wasn't for the billions that get paid every year in subsidies by our government in propping up the industry and cleaning up our waterways, it wouldn't exist. You know, I think it's something like two thirds, even three quarters of our native fish in New Zealand are threatened with extinction because our waterways are so bad. You know, our rivers, our, our swimming holes, they're not safe to swim in. We've got one of the highest, if not the highest rate of colorectal cancer in the world, um, you know, directly because of these, yeah, the nitrogen and all of these these bad things that are, that are leaching into our waters. Um, if you look up a-, a friend, Where's that nitrogen coming from, from the dairy farms? Yeah, because, uh, you know, the, the fertilizer is, is so, uh, the application is so heavy. And, um, you know, for example, if you look up Dr. Mike Joy, he's one of my, my favorite people. Um, he's a freshwater ecologist and his knowledge is just incredible, you know, and he's the one that, that gets this information out there. And so, Did you know that, you know, the New Zealand government is paying $40 million a year to farmers not to farm around Lake Taupo? because they don't want to make it nasty, you know, and they're paying another $40 million not to farm close to Lake Rotorua because that would make it nasty as well. There's just for those two lakes. And then there's something like the $12 billion in propping up the industry in Canterbury alone. Mm. So, you know, this, this is just New Zealand. So one of my points in the submission that I made was like, you know, find, look, look at what New Zealand is doing, go online, look up the green protein report because this is what is happening. These are recommendations um, which have been given by, by scientists and professors that have spent time in New Zealand and thought, what the hell are you lot doing? You know, look at what animal agriculture is doing to your country. Um, and yeah, as you know, I basically said to in, in the inquiry, you know, learn from what we're doing and don't do it. You know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's amazing. Like we, we talk about all those millions and billions of dollars to prop up these industries. And of course, that's taxpayers money as well um you know and, and i guess that was some evidence that we also heard in the inquiry and that came through in the submissions and a lot of what's being pushed overseas in especially in europe and america is this push that um our taxes shouldn't be going to subsidize and prop up these industries that are sort of having a natural die out because there's no the consumer demand is changing um and rather um, because of all the environmental impacts, the health impacts and all the animal cruelty, we could be putting tax towards actually helping those farmers trans transform into plant-based agriculture where the demand is increasing. Is that something that you think will ever come about in New Zealand and Australia? Yeah, I do. You know, I always, um, I, I say to my husband quite quite regularly you know I think it's inevitable when, when people come up to me like oh, I'm never stopping eating this and I'm gonna eat my meat and I'm gonna eat my cheese I'm like oh, that's fine mate you can think that way if you like but I really believe honestly that you know one day we won't have a choice anyway I, I sincerely believe that and I always used to think that you know it'd be a nice little pipe dream if in my lifetime you know there would be an end to animal agriculture and I was sort of thinking oh you might be pushing it a bit Jack you know but but now every week there is uh, more people doing great things there are more great initiatives there's more exciting news people are changing demand is growing and I'm thinking you know I might I might just see this a lot sooner than I think you know and yeah it's yeah, it's, 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 it's already been proven that it's not needed. And the, the stupid thing about it all, the subsidies, is the government is paying more out in subsidies than the entire industry is even earning. And, so, and that's already, you know, so how in heaven's name is it going to continue to be sustainable? It's just not, you know, they're in la-la land. And, and I really, it, it did tickle me when we went to the you know, giving, watching others give evidence at the hearing and everybody was saying, oh, the government's got to help us. The government's got to give us money. And it's like, why, like you, exactly like you said, why don't you put that money into change? Like New Zealand alone, just $12 billion for, for Canterbury. You know, we could do a lot with other things with $12 billion. You could feed a lot of people with that, you know? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's scary when you think about it, isn't it? And the numbers that are being thrown around. Now, Jackie, you've also created a whole lot of vegan resources. You have your own website and a vegan cookbook. 
Can you tell us a bit about those? Yeah, it all came about when uh, when my husband and I went vegan, we were living on the road in a tiny wee camper van called Ken. Uh, he's a Mazda Bongo, so he's kind of like a tradies van, you know, to, to the most people would think. So yeah, it was 4.6 meters long and 1.6 meters wide. And um, yeah, I went vegan. It was actually a, a petition that I, <laughs> I can I share this story. Is this all right if I share yes, this? Please. So the real catalyst for me going vegan was um, I see a lot of vegans all the time saying, oh, you know, nobody likes my Facebook posts. I'm, I've got all this stuff to share and nobody likes, you know, nobody's rushing to like my posts. It's like, well, they're not going to, are they? No one's going to send a love heart to animal cruelty or something that's, that's awful. And I had a friend um, that had been vegan for 25 years and every day she was posting on her Facebook and it was always these, these things that I didn't want to see. And uh, it was always sad things. And quite often it was first thing in the morning. And I'd be like, oh, I don't want to see that first thing in the morning. Scroll, 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 you know. Mm -hmm. And I seriously thought about unfollowing her. Um, much as, you know, she was my friend, lovely person. But I thought, oh, no, you're just ruining my day, day after day. But anyway, one day she uh, asked to sign this uh, petition. And it was all about banning farrowing crates in New Zealand for mother sows. And so I thought, oh, well, right then, you know, you've got to me this time. I'll click on this. I'll be a nice person, sign this petition. And what I saw was happening in our own country was just so shocking that I literally went vegan on the spot, literally wow. then and there. I was like, you know, I cannot be a part of, you know, consuming or purchasing any animal products from that moment on. I was just so shocked. Um, and yeah, we actually, we ended up dedicating the, the book to her as well, because yeah, she definitely sowed a, a big old seed there. Um, but yeah, we were living on the road at that time when that happened. And my husband who said at the time, you know, I'll, I'll, that's fine. I'll support you. If you want to go vegan, that's fine. But there is no way in hell I'm ever doing that. You know, he was Mr. 500 grams of cheese in a pasta bake. You know? <laughs> really was. Uh, and he went vegan five days later, exactly. Oh, cold, wow. cold turkey just did it. And so, yeah, we didn't know any other vegans. We were in uh, rural Southland in Gore at the time. We were the only vegans that we knew and the only, or the most, you know, exotic vegan food that we could get at that time was tofu uh things have changed a lot down in gore since then but yeah this was this was coming up four years ago and so um yeah we we were just learning together you know i guess i was really lucky in that that i, I had him and we could learn together and we learned to cook and we started this facebook page because well we were both a bit worried that we were going to starve to begin with um you know <laughs> <laughs> particularly him you know he was this big hairy welsh fella he was a big unit and he was he was a bit worried you know he wanted to do this but he was a bit worried that yeah what, what do vegans eat well not not very much and so yeah we started cooking together we got online you know we had nobody to bounce ideas off but we found far from being restricted um and boring there was so much vegan food out there and i think the fact that we had to cook everything from scratch because there wasn't any of this convenient stuff was probably the best thing that happened for us so we started this facebook page now my facebook page is a bit a bit different you know i don't care i'll talk to all and sundry about veganism and <laughs> but at the time we were like mm, well you know we're very excited about being vegan and we're, we're you know learning all this great Great stuff but you know we, we don't want to upset our friends or bore them saying hey look at my dinner so we started this this facebook page camper van kitchen and we just started sharing the things that we'd learned um uh yeah little tips for the day as we went and the recipes that we were doing and we were having a great old time and we just did it for fun but we ended up with followers from all over the world wow. and i think we went vegan one august and by christmas we had amassed about 80 recipes, something like that. Wow. And so we said, well, we've learned so much in such a short time. How about we, you know, we'll put them in a, in a free ebook and we'll just put it out there for, um, for anybody else that wants to learn, you know, to want to go uh, vegan for the new year. And we didn't really think that anyone would sort of take much notice. And that had over 40,000 downloads. Wow. And we thought, oh, crikey, <laughs> wish we charge a dollar for those now. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, <laughs> you could have done something with that. <laughs> exactly. We could have, yeah, got a, got a nice big motor home with that. But, <laughs> so well, we just kept on going and we kept on going. And um, yeah, I ended up, I also ended up having surgery the following year. And so I ended up bedridden in the van for quite a long time, had uh, two major surgeries. And that was something that, you know, being vegan couldn't help me with. Um, 
but although I think it certainly helped my recovery a, a lot faster, yes. definitely. But at that time, I was pretty bored and, you know, we didn't have any income and that kind of thing. Gareth had to do everything for me. I thought, oh, I've got to make something good happen. I've got to make something good happen. What will I do? You know, and we were getting close to the end of another year. And we said, well, we've probably got enough recipes to do another ebook now, haven't we? How about we just charge maybe a dollar this time, you know, and even if only a thousand people download it compared to last year, that's fine. But, you know, that, that might be a good experiment. And I said, well, actually, wouldn't it be nice? You know, maybe I'll, I'll send it through to some publishers and see if any of them are interested. And so I, I sent through the recipes that we had so far and was quite blasé about it. I said, you know, we're going to do it anyway, but if you want to be part of it, <laughs> let me know. Uh, and I had six publishers get in touch with me that same day. Um, and two of the, one of them, the first one to get back to me, offered, offered a two book deal. So that was great. And so it, it just went from there. And I guess it went to show that that is why you know that that's how the market is changing that they were just so keen everybody wanted a piece of the vegan pie as it were and so um so yeah that came that? out in March. March March of this year and that came out book if people want to go and find it it's called easy and delicious everyday vegan and um yeah it's it's out in Australia and New Zealand actually so yeah you can get it on all, yes. all the online retailers and dimmocks and all of that kind of thing as well so um, yeah got any Christmas recipes for everyone I do like making vegan Baileys. That's a, <laughs> That's a good one. I like that. <laughs> I really like I really like Christmas um, being vegan at Christmas because you know you can have whatever you like. You know you're not steeped in this tradition. You can experiment. You can you can really go with whatever you want to. So I mean, one year we had um, it's actually in the book. It's a a crispy tofu noodle bowl, and um, we just nice. yeah we weren't we didn't know what we wanted for Christmas. It was just the two of us. So we said, well, we'll have a play in the kitchen and see what we come up with. And um, and that's yeah, that's what was our Christmas one. Yes. <laughs> Perfect. But we get more bolder every year. <laughs> good, good, good. <laughs> it's good to have traditions, but also good to just expand and try something new, right? Especially Exactly. Christmas. I should say, actually, I'm celiac too. So um, things like Satan and, and, you know, a lot of those meat replacements I, I can't have. So that was another great thing that we found with the with the, the cookbook is that, um, you know, I was able to be vegan and gluten free and just, yeah, appeal to a lot more people, make things easier. Because a lot of us vegans are also gluten intolerant. Absolutely. Um, two of my team are off gluten and one of my good friends is off gluten. So that's another a good book to know about, to know that there's all those sort of options in that book as well. I have one last question for you, Jackie. Thank you so much for, for bearing with me. We've been going for over 40 minutes now. Oh, hey. <laughs> <laughs> um, but look, I hear you've also got a lot of great plans for the future. Um, I think you've also doing perhaps some volunteer work with Earthling Ed, who was one of our previous Facebook Live guests as well, who I've interviewed. Um, what, what, what are your plans? What are you moving into? Um, what kind of activism spaces are you, are you looking at getting into? Oh, crikey, where to start? I think I, I joined something this, uh, this year called, um, during lockdown, it's called the Vegan Women's Leadership Network. And um, it was founded by Katrina Fox, who is a wonderful uh, Australian-based advocate. And that has given me so much strength and so much confidence. You know, when I very first started speaking out, um, I should really say, you know, when I, when the penny dropped, as I, as I mentioned, you know, I didn't make that connection between dairy and death and just how much devastation, heartbreak, just everything bad that is, you know, um, it caused. And the penny didn't drop for me, really, even after I was vegan, I never really truly understood what hideousness I've been a part of until um, Jessica Strathy, we met up in a, a Facebook group and she she's another um, ex dairy farmer who has, has spoken out and she um, is co founder of Mother is, Mothers Against Dairy here in New Zealand. And she got in touch with me and she said, you have got to use your voice, you've got to use your voice, you know, you've got this unique perspective, we, we've got to do this. And I was terrified the first time and I, I did a video for safe, they talked me into doing it and I made them black out my face and distort my voice and all this. And then I would see, um, you know, I, I was really worried and then I would see um, advocates like James Aspie and Earthling Ed and they were out there again and again and again. And, you know, when I kind of went into my shell for a while, because when the penny dropped what I'd been part of, I found it really, really hard to live with myself. It was just mind blowing. 
And, you know, I, I still do. I probably always will. You know, I don't think that will ever go away. Every time I see a cow, you know, people love to put me near cows and say, you know, look, you'll, you'll love to go and, and pat this cow or this calf. And I'm like, no, I've betrayed you all. You know, I don't think that will ever go away. But I've had some wonderful experiences with cows since. And, you know, I will do everything that I can to to speak up for them but yeah Jess was really got what got me into activism and in uh, Earthling Ed and James Aspie they got me being braver and I thought well if they're standing up there the way they are and just not bowing to anybody not not backing down there is no way that I can back down I've, I've got to keep going with the information that I know and so yeah Katrina when I joined the the leadership network um she got me into talking to, um, I did a 45 minute presentation on VegFest UK and that was very th cathartic. I was terrified, but um, you know, I cried several times, I think. And I thought no one's gonna watch this, but the feedback I've had has been incredible. And, you know, I wanna do more than that. I, I can't speak out enough now. And Jessica said to me, you know, the only way, cause I said to her once, you know, how do you live with the guilt of, of what we were once a part of. And she said, well, the way I look at it, and she, the only way I can deal with it is that we were put on this earth for a purpose. And we got this insight and this experience for a reason, and, and we've got to do something with it. And so that's really what I want to focus on. And so, yeah, like you say, I've been um, volunteering for Earthling Ed with Surge, I've been doing some writing for him. Um, I volunteer full time for Vegan FTA. Um, if you haven't seen that before, we've got something like four hundred. <laughs> uh, oh yeah, four hundred and twenty thousand followers. You know, so we, we want to get up to a million followers. That that's our uh, our aim that we want to do. Just keep growing that and just pushing activism and inspiring people. You know, more people to get more active. Um, because with me, you know, having a, a chronic illness as well, that was how I I found more diverse ways to get into activism so if you haven't been to vegan fda shameless plug uh go and check it out check out our activist series because it all came about from people like myself who've had chronic illnesses and you know we can't all be on the front lines we can't all be doing vigils and cubes no matter how much we want to but it doesn't mean that we can't be active or that we shouldn't be active and so that's what we're all about um yeah working with um with ed also um refarmed as well um trying to learn as much as i can about you know farming alternatives in new zealand because i don't have all the answers yet and so when farmers say to me well you know what what do you expect me to grow on these hills you know nothing's going to grow on there i want to have the answers and you know, i think as many of us as possible need to to find out what actually grows in our regions in our countries so working on that and also um talking of ed again we are appearing alongside with him at the belief retreat it's a virtual plant-based um living retreat uh january the 9th and 10th 2021 so um that, that's going to be brilliant there is uh there's us my husband gareth and i for for vegan fta there's earthling ed there's ruby roth there is amy jean davis from um you know la animal save there's there's some fantastic faces so if you anybody that you know wants to learn more about activism or living vegan or there's no someone that needs a little bit of steering for january for the new year um send them along to the belief retreat as well <laughs> perfect and it's great that it's online it's you know like there's so many things that are coming online now that weren't accessible to so many people and you know that's been one advantage i guess that that we're now able to sort of reach out across countries where some people just couldn't afford to or didn't have the ability to be able to do so it's opened some of those doors and hopefully you know, even even as things lift now, which is great, hopefully some of those doors remain open. Absolutely, absolutely. It's going to be a really interactive workshop. You know, it's not just sort of staring at a screen. We've got exercises for people to do. We've got interaction. You know, they're supposed to be quite quite up there with the technology. So it's really exciting to be part of something so interactive. Fantastic. Well, thank you again, Jackie. It's been truly inspiring hearing both your story, but also the activism work that you've been doing. Um, and, and as you say, it's, um, you know, it's like you've got this purpose that, um, and, and I can't imagine how many people you have inspired to change or open their minds or even just vegans that were already vegan, but inspired them into activism. So thank you so much for all of your work. Um, as I said, this is our last Facebook Live of 2020. Um, we are probably going to do some more Facebook Live interviews in 2021 because I know they've been relatively popular. If you've got an idea on who you'd like to see us interview, please add that to the comments so we can look at interviewing some more people in 2021. Thank you again, Jackie, and thank you for everything you do for animals. 
Thank you so much. And thank you for everything you do for animals. <laughs>